In this TaxLayer Pro training video, we're going to walk through the steps of initial program setup and configuration. All right, I've gone through my account, I've downloaded and installed the TaxLayer Pro software, and I've got the icon here on my desktop. So I'm going to double click this icon to open it for the first time. And as I go through my initial configuration steps, the first thing that I see is a thank you. I have access to the TaxLayer Pro Quick Start Manual if I wish, but I'm just going to go ahead and click OK on this message. The program asks me if I want to restore the configuration from a backup disk. But this is my first time through setting up the program on my transmitting computer, so I don't have a backup of my configuration to restore. I'm going to answer this question no. And again, I emphasize that this is my initial setup on my first computer, which I'm going to designate as my transmitting computer. The program asks me if I'm using a network. For sake of this video, I'm going to answer no. I'm not going to get into a lot of the network setup on this little configuration video. I see a, what I'll call a pause to refresh screen, sort of a review menu. Am I using a network? No. Is this my transmitting computer? Yes. And the program is going to be installed on my C drive, on my computer's hard drive. So I can exit. Now I'm going to fill in my firm information. So I'm going to click OK on this message. And this takes me to the dialog box where I'll enter my firm information, my firm name, contact name, street address of my firm, the zip code, the city, the state, phone number, fax number if I have one, my EFIN, particularly important, and my firm employer identification number if I have one. If your firm does not have an EIN, just leave this area blank. All right, I filled in all of my firm information. And I'm going to go ahead and click OK on this dialog box. Once again, I'm at a menu, a company setup menu, where I can review the information that I've entered into the program for my company setup. Everything looks OK here, so I'm going to exit this menu. And now I'm at the spot where I would enter my preparers. You'll see this window, this little dialog box, throughout the program with the new button, edit, delete, sometimes a print button and the exit. But I'm going to go ahead and enter myself in as a preparer. I'm going to click on the new button. I'm going to give myself a preparer code. Now preparer code number can run from 1 to 999. The preparer code number serves two purposes. If you hire seasonal preparers, of course you'll want to know which preparer has done which return you would identify them by their preparer code number. The preparer code number also serves to print your company information on the bottom of your 1040 forms. So I've given myself a preparer code number. I'm going to go ahead and enter in my social security number here and my PTIN. Remember, very important, if you're a paid preparer, you must have a PTIN. And my name. And if I were self-employed, I would indicate that here in this checkbox. When I click OK, I'm given the opportunity to review my preparer information that I've entered in so far, make any changes that might be necessary. I may want to go ahead and put in my email address while I'm here. And also while we're at this menu, let's look at option number 14, Preparer Security. Now let's just look at some of the options here in the Preparer Security menu. For instance, if I ran an office where I hired seasonal preparers, what I would do is assign my preparers and myself as well a unique username and password That way, I can control 
the functions in the program that each of my preparers has access to. Let's say, for instance, that I wanted to keep this preparer out of my main configuration menu. I would just simply click on number 9, main configuration, and indicate that the preparer does not have access. And notice the question, main configuration changes to no. One other important point here at the prepare security menu, I could limit the tax return access to only those returns that were prepared by this preparer. In other words, only those returns that have this preparer's uh, preparer code. So I could click on number 32, tax returns access. Right now, this preparer has unlimited access to all of the returns. If I click on number 32, I can access those returns. I'm sorry, I can limit those returns to only the returns prepared by this preparer indicated by his preparer code. So the, there's a lot of functions that you can turn on and off here in the preparer security menu. Now I'm at the prepare edit menu again. I can take a look and make sure that all of the information for this particular preparer is correct. I can exit this menu. Now I have the opportunity to enter another preparer or to edit the information for this preparer. I'm not going to enter another preparer at this time, so let's go ahead and exit the preparer menu. Now I'm given the opportunity to select my bank. If I'm using bank products, I would select my bank at this menu option here. Just for purposes of this video, I'm going to indicate number seven, currently not offering bank products. I'm going to exit this menu and again just a review menu if I had made the in, an incorrect selection I could click on number one it will take me back to my bank selection menu but again I'm for this video I'm just going to indicate currently not offering bank products now I'm at the fee menu here's where I would set a particular uh, fee for each of my forms. So let's say for instance I wanted to charge for my 1040. I would simply click on number 11 to highlight it. Enter the fee that I want to charge for that 1040. And I could do the same for the 1040A, the 1040EZ. I could set a range for a particular range of forms to set fees for. I could pull prior year fees if I were a prior year tax layer user. Once you're finished with the fee menu, just go ahead and exit. Now I'm at the path menu. The only thing that you should probably need to change in the path menu is a secondary backup path. As you finish with a tax return, the program will send a backup copy to the hard drive on your computer. If you choose to, you could use a secondary backup path as well, a USB drive, an external hard drive, something of that nature. So what I could do is click on number four, secondary backup path, and I could choose my USB drive. Now the one thing you do have to keep in mind, if you do select a secondary backup path such as a USB drive, external hard drive. You need to keep that drive inserted into the computer while using the TaxSlayer program. Again I mentioned as you exit a tax return the program is going to send a backup copy to your hard drive and to the secondary backup path. If the program can't find your USB drive or your external hard drive, you'll get an error message as you exit your tax return. So now let's go ahead and exit the path menu and continue on with this initial configuration and setup of the program. The next step in the initial configuration and setup 
of the program allows me to set up macros. These are simply keystroke savers. In other words, I could set up a, a large employer. Let's say, for instance, if my tax office sat outside of a large industry and I knew that I was going to get oh, 50, 75, 100 tax returns from this industry. At this point in the setup, I could set up that employer's information, his EIN address and so forth, so that I would already have it in the program when that first client walks through the door. But the good news is, once I prepare a return for that first client, the information is going to be stored in the program anyway. So I could enter the information here in the macro setup or just wait until that first client comes in type in the W2 information it'll be stored in the program same for child care providers if there were a uh, if there was one child care provider that maybe I was going to use in the program over and over and over again I could enter in that child care providers information at this point in the program other macros include uh, bank routing transit numbers, um, K-1 entities, things of that nature. Again, you can enter the, that information in the program here if you have it, or just wait until that first client comes in. The program is going to store it anyway. I'm going to skip over the macros section for this video, so I'm going to answer this question, no. The program now asks me, did you purchase the TaxSlayer Pro Premium Bundle? Let's go ahead and say yes to this so that we can go through the premium configuration steps. First, I'm asked to enter my TaxLayer premium activation code that I received when I purchased the premium software. So in this menu, I'll enter my premium activation code. I'm asked to indicate an email method. What this means is premium, the premium package gives me the opportunity to email my clients copies of their returns that are password protected. So I'm going to choose an email method here. Unless you're familiar with SMTP protocols, things of that nature, let's go ahead and click indirect through TaxSlayer approach. Go ahead and choose the default. I'm going to enter my email address so my clients will have an idea of who these emails are coming from. And now I can exit this menu. I'm now at the premium configuration menu. I've chosen to use the paper cut paperless office option. We encourage you to watch the paper cut video that will explain how to use this option. Number six, I could, use, I could send text messages to my clients indicating that their bank products are ready. Maybe uh, I've printed a check for one of my bank product clients. The check has reached my office and I want to send a text message to my clients letting them know that the check is ready. So if I click on number six, I need to read this message. Sending text alerts to your clients is a real-time system. It runs 24 hours a day. So make sure you read this carefully and agree to these terms. And now I can exit the premium configuration menu. I've finished with the initial setup and configuration of the software. So now the software is telling me that it's preparing to exit so that the configuration settings can be applied. I also want to make sure that my current system date is correct. The date is incorrect. It's telling me to change the date in Windows. But my date appears to be correct, so I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And I've finished with the initial configuration and setup of the software. Thanks for watching.